Normally, when people take up doing challenge runs in games, they pump the brakes a little bit and ease their way into it. A natural progression would be starting with something like, can you beat the Witch Queen wearing only blues? But not Riley, I dive in headfirst in these challenges where hiding around every corner is a swift kick in the dick. Which is exactly what I would consider this entire run to be. Now you may be thinking, Riley, I've witnessed you dip, duck, and die through the entirety of the Witch Queen campaign without taking a single hit of damage. It couldn't possibly get more difficult from there. Well, after spending an ungodly amount of my life that I'll never get back, I dare to go above and beyond and ask the question, can you beat the Witch Queen campaign on Legendary with a damage Traveler's Chosen? When it comes to challenges, that doesn't sound too bad at all. But when you dig underneath the surface, the problems start to rear their ugly head. For starters, with the campaign being on Legendary, there are certain modifiers like Match Game On, which already makes damage tough enough to deal unless you have the correct matching element, which is something that I'll never have considering the damage Traveler's Chosen is a kinetic weapon with the stopping power of a wet fart. Not only that, the campaign is on Legendary difficulty where no matter how good your gear is, you are capped at a certain level, meaning enemies will always have a default level that they're at that will get you absolutely laid clean out if you get caught lacking. The last truly atrocious aspect of this gun is that it only has 9 bullets in total, meaning that when paired with the other things I mentioned, any enemy that has shield will take multiple clips to bring down. This challenge really puts some hair on my chest. I eat at the salty spittoon now. But before we dive into the challenge run and witness my colossal ass kicking, I need to set some ground rules. We have boundaries here, sir! One, I am not allowed to deal damage with anything other than the Traveler's Chosen. That means any abilities that are offensive and directly deal damage to an enemy are off limits. However, abilities like Well of Radiance, Heal Grenades, and Rifts that buff the damage of Traveler's Chosen are allowed. Secondly, environmental damage is allowed if I use the Traveler's Chosen to proc these environmentals, meaning things like moths, explosive barrels, or even my sparrow if I get lucky enough to land in the right spot. Lastly, the only way to progress is if I do a finisher on the Hive Ghosts, so I am allowed to do that as well. Other Otherwise, this video would be extremely short, or I would be locked into an eternal battle with a Hive Guardian. With that out of the way, let's kick off this challenge and give ourselves only the primest of brain damage. So to start things off, we equip our damage Traveler's Chosen, and just when I think it can't get any worse, the Traveler's Chosen is capped at 1350 power and doesn't allow me to put any mods on it. All it has on it is a single perk, meaning we are going in absolutely raw. On my helmet, I equip sidearm targeting, as when you only have 9 bullets, every bullet counts. I then equip 2 sidearm loaders, as this gun has the reload speed to my grandma texting me back. I equip Luna Faction boots to overcome this absolute hot dog water of a reload speed, and also add on high energy fire on my bond, thinking it might help me deal damage. But then I pulled the smartest of moves by not equipping a single charge of light mod in true Riley Reloaded fashion. I then move on to my subclass menu and equip a powering rift to hopefully improve this gun's damage ever so slightly, put on the Echo of Obscurity for the added recovery, Echo of Dilation for the mobility and intellect increase, and the Echo of Domineering for some reason. I think I just wanted to equip something that gave me a stat increase, but I can't even throw my grenades in this challenge so I don't know what that was for. I then load up the arrival, sprint towards the Cabal, and lay waste to the ones without shields. Using environmentals and hiding behind cover, I make short work of this encounter until I get my first real taste of match game with the Imperial Cannoneer in the middle. I deal enough damage until he runs away, but I catch up and put him in the ground. Then launch myself towards the gun. Things go pretty well for the beginning of this run as I easily beat the cheeks off these giant turtles, usually spending an entire clip per one Cabal. I hack the terminal until the shielded guy walks in like he owns the place and he slaps me silly. I'm sorry sir, I guess I am in the wrong place. <laughs> but not being one to learn my lessons no matter how beneficial, like a fucking nerd, I return for vengeance, I'm taught yet another lesson with the mightiest of melees, finally assert my dominance on he who kicked my teeth in, and then battle his best friend, the esteemed Colossus, giving him the old Skyrim dragon treatment as I hit him with the equivalent of a squirt gun. Moving on, I get drive by by the ship as it flies away, tighten my nuts, and move into the gun once again. Now they're starting to realize that if they simply bring shields, they have the advantage, and I'm starting to see more and more of them. Phalanxes are also a problem as their hitboxes are a little bit bigger than the shield, and even when you deactivate it by shooting the middle, it still is difficult to shoot them in the head. I spend five minutes fighting this Imperial Technician, and then move on to the engine bay. Now in my past videos, I've constantly told you guys about my ankles folding under the slightest pressure, but finally I have proof! I dive down this hole like an absolute G, only to get faded on the pipe, solidifying the fact that I'll never make it in the NBA. I get resurrected outside once again. I swear this mission has it out for me on these challenge runs, as whenever I play it normally, I respawn right where I die, but whenever I'm doing a challenge run, the game goes, I said we sad today! and spawns me as far away from where I died as possible. I cautiously land in the engine bay and begin the fight inside. I'm surprisingly agile with this gun as I swiftly take down Scions at a breakneck pace. But with me feeling my oats, I am humbled by the Centurion who teaches me that lead poisoning is a serious threat, and it's right here where I realize that this is a darkness zone, which means that there are other darkness zones all over this campaign. Meaning I'll have to beat many sections in the game in a single try with a gun that deals the equivalent damage of drinking water after eating a mint. Anyway, I roll up on the engine bay once again, and with careful shooting, retreating, and superior angles, I kill one Cabal Engineer and rinse and repeat
repeat on the second. I then light a fire in the elevator, get abducted by aliens, and adjust the cannon's trajectory. In my attempt to stay in peak physical form for the coming battle, I pump some iron, shoot myself out of a cannon, abusing my immortality, and finally encounter both my greatest ally and my most wicked foe in this run. The Light Moth, in this match game world, is one of the few things that gives me solace as it takes hundreds of bullets to take down a single shielded foe, but luckily the Light Moths have the great treat of dealing arc damage when shot, causing the knights around to lose their shields, making it all the easier for me to fight. Disregarding that information for the time being, I instantly pop the moth, meaning I will have to give him the old five minute razzle dazzle. Moving on to the room where you defend the plates and bank the tributes, I just hang back and shoot from afar, making good use of my rift for the longer ranges. It's slow and steady, but things go pretty smooth, and I move to where the two hive knights are. They clown on me real good, but I return stronger than ever, clean them up, and move on to the next room. This room has me dipping, ducking, and diving like no tomorrow, but I kill off the little guys and get lasered by this ogre in my desperate attempt to run away- I mean, stand my ground and fight. I then respawn and deliver upon them death by a thousand tiny bullets and move on to the outside landing. This challenge so far has taken me 30 minutes of shooting to get to this point. Honestly, not as bad as I thought it was going to be, at least for the first mission. There's a weird sort of poetry to this challenge, as this gun is the one that guided me out of the last city when it fell all those years ago. Just for that fact alone, I have a weird sense of pride using this gun, even if it hits like an anemic person who stood up too fast. I then begin my battle with the first hive light bearer of this challenge. Now don't let any amount of damage he takes fool you. For some reason, this one is way weaker than any of the ones even just a little bit later in the campaign. After shooting him and realizing his health was going down at a pretty good rate, I was pleasantly surprised, as I thought I would have to shoot them for ages to take down. Not only was I right, later these light bearers begin to display the worst aspects of every single class in the game by beginning to play like the sweatiest of PvP players. <laughs> of which, I am one of them. It made me realize that I hate all of us. It grenades me real good, but thankfully this isn't the darkness zone and I remove his living from his body and make a morally ambiguous decision by crushing a sentient creature between my knuckles. I then gather some tributes, die, gather more tributes, and enter through the portal. I painfully, slowly, but surely kill the hive at the door, slowly pepper Savathun until she takes it personally and her minions teach me the new meaning of the term emotional damage as I have to reset the fight from the beginning. This fight has me moving all over the room trying to avoid gunfire as Savathun spawns a lot of minions in here to deal with me. I had to be on my toes, but with good agility and foot placement, I managed to take her down. This was actually tougher than the no damage run. Thankfully, I only died a couple of times before finally landing the killing blow, beating the arrival with only a damage traveler's chosen. The investigation is a nice little mission to put after the first one. It's sort of a segue mission where not a lot of moving parts are in it and you can complete it in a relatively quick amount of time. That is, if you're not using a damage traveler's chosen. <laughs> that increasingly loses effectiveness as the missions go on. I think that it's because the level cap gets higher, the game still factors in the level of your gun. Meaning, you might be above level cap, but your gun is starting to lose its damage as the gap between it and the mission's level cap expands. I'm watching this old footage after using this in the later missions, just realizing that I was in the good times until they were gone. Hindsight truly is 2020. Right here is where I get my first taste of the light bearers using crucible tactics, as soon as I pop my well, this knight rushes me and splatters me against a hedge, breaking nearly every bone in my body, killing me instantly. I 1v1 the knight in a rumble lobby and pull a crucible war crime as I send his ghost back to the light. I then take another moment to ponder my life as I look at the Traveler's Chosen, wondering if it's all worth it and I'm once again shocked by the fact I cannot mod this thing at all. We descend into the tunnels, run through the scenic hallway, get to the gate, and vastly underestimate the firepower as I get firing line by a literal army, but with tactical retreat- I mean tactical standing my ground, I get blasted, res a little ways away, and after much shooting, finally kill the two bosses with an unusually high health bars. I lower the gate, dealing with the enemy slowly but surely, and move to where you fight the hive wizard. I rinse and repeat on the big knights and then focus fire on the wizard. Keep an eye on this wizard during this fight. I'm not gonna spoil it, but he does something that poses an extreme threat later in this run as the gun starts to lose its damage and the missions go on and on. I encountered another problem in this fight. I remember Bungie was saying they were working on an accessibility patch that would allow you to put your guns into full auto. This entire time, I've been tapping the trigger over and over. I tapped the trigger so much, my fingers were actually starting to hurt. I worked out my fingers so much during this challenge, I swear I got fucking vibranium bones in my index finger. <laughs> but I crushed the ghost with the might of Zeus and went to speak to my old pal Finch. Before moving Moving on to the ghosts, I decided it was time to make a gear change, traveling to the tower to put it together. My original thinking was I would use Luna Factions in my well to keep a consistent rate of fire with my gun. That made it so the uptime on this was fairly limited as my exotic was tied to my well. I returned to the tower to pick up an Ophidian's Aspect and change my mods around to include a ton of resilience as I was starting to take more damage and wanted to be prepared for the next mission. With being all geared up, it was time to take on the ghosts. So far these missions haven't been too tough to make me lose my sanity. The ghost wasn't terrible and I did a moderate amount of damage with the Traveler's Choke. Chosen. Acolytes go down in about three bullets, and as long as I stay agile with the Hive Guardians, I can make short work of them. However, in this opening area, the cheeky bastards at Bungie decided it'd be a great idea to put a Shrieker in the way. These things 
are the bane of my existence in the later missions. Nothing in this life can even begin to explain how annoying these things were to kill in this challenge run. They're active behind cover, and sometimes they'll even be able to shoot you if you're behind cover, and will continue to pepper you wherever you are, making it so you can only stick your head out for a second or two before you get riddled with holes. This being legendary, every time I poke my head out for a millisecond, I'm already half dead. It's painful to deal with them as it takes many bullets, and they're usually at a range where you can only land a shot or two before you need to go back and heal. It's a long process, but I kill the Shrieker, kill the Wizard, and squeeze the light out of his ghost. This room is a tremendous pain in the ass. Not only do I have Hive that are arc shielded, launching AoE damage attacks for me at the back of the room, and also spawns in two light bears to shit all over my cornflakes, all while I deal the damage of a paper cut. Not only that, the Hunter Hive Guardians played exactly like your average hunter does in the Crucible by flipping back and forth, making it impossible to hit. When you did manage to land a couple of hits, they would go hide behind a rock. Don't worry, I'm not just picking on hunters this one. Hive Guardians display some telling signs of being a guardian. But you try to readjust just to get your titties slapped every time you close the gap. I died so much and wound up spending about 20 minutes in this room alone. And it is a darkness zone, so every death is a reset to the beginning of the encounter. The way I beat this room is by taking down as many little enemies as I could, slowly whittling down the light bear at the front while dodging the AoE damage from the boomer cannons and their swarm grenades. Once I killed the first light bear, I would go to the back of the room over here and take cover, repeating the process until I killed the other light bear. The shielded enemies would sometimes guard the hive guardians while he flipped around and went sicko mode, making me have to play pretty carefully to get this done. I clear the guardians and a swarm of scorn spawn behind me, but they are pushovers compared to the others, and I finally clear this room. Moving on to where the scorn walker is, thankfully, it's not in a darkness zone, so I'm free to get all up in his guts and blast him one hit point of damage at a time. It doesn't actually take that long, and I kill the walker with relative ease. I slowly but surely whittle down the enemies that guard the crystals, keeping my stellar agility the whole time, and after a death or two, I descend into the pit. The boss of this pit's first encounter is easy enough, but the second one isn't afraid to pull some of the bullshit strings, if you ask me. <laughs> I'm fighting the boss in the middle, and he channels his inner trickster and lays me out from across the arena. Well, look at this amazing move. You can see the boss lingering at the other side of the room, and then I get bungeed and he Goku instant transmissions his ass directly into my urethra, pushing me into a scorn grenade. <laughs> I don't know the scorn were employing Michael Jackson to moonwalk a fist up my head, but I was actually laughing pretty good at that one. And in this arena, I actually learned a pretty cool trick thanks to this challenge. Did you know that when you shoot one of these pus sacks near an enemy, deal some damage to them? It will actually apply the effect of blinding grenades. This was a godsend in this room as it made enemies with shields easy to deal with. I just avoided the middle, killed the scorn shielding the crystal, broke the crystal, I then cleared the middle, and finally hammered the boss when the area was safe. It was a simple rinse and repeat, but that didn't stop this fight from taking forever. This entire mission took about two hours of fighting, and when I finally landed the final bullet, I was extremely relieved and concerned, because if this was the third mission, I can only imagine what staring down Savathun would be like. I took a breather of exhaustion, and finally beat the ghosts. The communion proved to be a tougher challenge than I had originally thought. I remember it being a pretty short mission, so I thought it wouldn't be too much of a challenge. However, nearly every enemy in this beginning area is tanky, and they have the range advantage to back it up. I have a dinky little pistol. It has nine bullets in total. The opening area goes really well until I get caught off guard by the sniper who pulls one of the greatest shots of all time. But the only things to note in this area is that I killed an esteemed colossus by hiding in this mountain and firing at him for eight literal years. Then move on to fighting the tank. I just jump up and dodge the missiles while slowly picking at the side jets. These things are beefy, but they really aren't the toughest enemy that I've faced. Being at this distance gets rid of the short range attacks and I can take it down no problem. The second tank uses its full arsenal at this range and I almost eat it big time and have to redo the entire battle, but I bring it home and ascend the pyramid. Inside, I let the anguish of this gun get to me, and this is when I begin to realize it's taking more bullets to take down even minor enemies. Even with that, though, I'm sliding underneath enemy shots and raining down fire like an angel of death. I repeat the process by the stairs and once again deliver death at a snail's pace. Moving on to the first battle, I explode some barrels, taking down the enemies near them and begin to open fire on the Imperial Deserter. The damage is less than stellar in this room, and this room spawns so many guys with shields. I mean, look at this shit! They also deal a good amount of damage. I was switching out my gear, trying every trick in the book to find the best strategy. But I play my cards right using my rifts to buff damage and take it very slow and steady. I still die a couple of times and wind up killing this boss in only about 50 minutes. The final boss battle was a tricky one. There were a lot of snipers, shielded enemies, and the boss has phases where you have to stick your neck out into the crowd in order to shut down the jammers. I died a lot in this room, and each time it wound up taking me about 20 minutes to get back to where I was. The strategy was to pick off any enemies I could when the jammers were up, but constantly stay on the move from cover to cover. I was able to take pot shots at the boss, and when I finally got him low enough, I rushed him in the middle and landed the killing blow. I let the depression take over me as I allowed my trigger figure to heal. I sat here for about three minutes, sniffed in that good darkness, and beat the communion with crippling depression. The mirror is quickly 
becoming my favorite mission in these challenge runs because it's short, it has pretty weak enemies, and the engagements themselves aren't too tough. That being said though, this challenge takes what should have been a 10 minute mission and into 33 minutes. <laughs> the first section is just a couple of scorn, with the only big problem being the captain. They have shields and are not afraid to run up and to deliver upon you the sweet release of death. But with good aim and careful maneuvering, I died three times, delivered swift justice, and moved on to the tunnels. The tunnels aren't that remarkable, but it's here that I learned that scorn raiders do not play around and are more than happy to one-shot you if you so much as show your pinky toe around the corner. Not only that, they like to charge their shots before you even stuck your head out, but I kill some abominations in the tunnels and enter the boss fight. This raider does some sexy spins and I slowly whittle away at the boss's health. This is a tanky boy that continually spawns little enemies, so clearing them out doesn't really help too much. There are little guys that rush you and ones that attack you from a range, making it so you can easily get overwhelmed if you don't do something about them. This dramatically extended the boss fight as I had to stop dealing damage to make myself a safe area by clearing out the little enemies that were spawned in. Another pain point is that once the boss's health gets low enough, he spawns the Scorn Raiders that we establish have no problem with absolutely dunking on you. You have to react to them quickly, otherwise they will style on you and then emote in absolute disrespect. But after about 30 minutes, I persevered with decisive playing and landed the final shot. This time, when talking to Tiny Osiris, there was no happiness, only pain. And I took a breather to get ready for the next mission because even though this challenge is a pain, I gotta get my head in the game. The cream always rises to the top and life is like a sandwich. No matter which way you flip it, the bread come first. Little funny note on that joke, I told Survival Theory that one and he said, uh, doesn't the crust come first? As if that wasn't already a part of bread. <laughs> and it made me realize my boy might be retarded. But taking a brief detour from the challenge, I decided that I could use some gear to better help me with it. As this spot in the challenge, one of my biggest issues was health. I don't want to run a healing rift because the only thing keeping me sane is the damage I get from my empowering rift. In order to make this challenge a little bit easier on myself, I decided it was finally time for me to go collect my sacred filaments. Sacred filaments being the warlock exotic that grants you to hour when you pop your empowering rift. Something that would be extremely useful in giving me more uptime as the challenge progresses. I didn't pick up this exotic at the end of the legendary campaign as I wanted to get one that would have a good role on it. This seemed like the perfect opportunity to get an exotic and help me in one of my challenges at the same time. It just so happened that this was indeed leg day and you know for a fact your boy wasn't skipping it. I'm okay with using my regular gear in this entire thing as it's outside of the main challenge and I beat the lost sector getting my sacred filaments on the first try. But just because the bungee gods can't let me have anything they made the gear drop with... <laughs> Oh god, 23 strength. Oh, I'm gonna be sick. I then changed my style and became the rusty backpacker with a newfound power and moved on to the cunning. My gun is starting to deal less and less damage as time goes on. I've got wet pancake slaps and they have slug launchers, but not one to give up easily. I will ram my head against that wall with my newfound heel until it breaks. But with my newfound exotic, I easily clear the scorn out from the side. The abominations do take a while to kill, but with some good movement and shooting, I kill them at a pretty good pace. Moving onto the bridge, I get into a fight with these two scorn chieftains. I then get the bright idea to run away and I realize that I don't have to fight these enemies. I can pull the old yeet and skeet and make it away without any repercussions. I try to fight these raiders and get dropped in seconds. I move onto the plate to lower the bridge, but not before getting raided once again. I kill the scorn on the bridge and get ready for the boss fight. Remember everything I said about the Scorn Raiders? Well imagine if they took that whole concept of kicking your ass at a breakneck pace and applied that into a boss. He has no qualms about one-shotting you. Upon respawning, I am dropped once again, and I stop here to think about how I'm actually going to be able to do this. What I like about these challenges is that it promotes thinking outside of the box in order to get things done. Which is funny because even though I collectively have three brain cells between my ears, I actually managed to come up with a pretty genius way of dealing with the boss in this section. I post her up on the side of this pillar and use it as cover, slowly but surely picking off the boss every time he peeks his head. This boss can still one-shot me from up here, it's just harder for him to aim. And when I peek out, he does exactly what the smaller Scorn Raiders do by making sure he has a charged shot with my name on it before I've even poked a pixel of myself out around the corner. After I make good progress, I slip up and he winds up putting me down, making me have to redo the entire fight. So many bullets. Why? After a stupid amount of time, I get him to a point where he becomes immune. The only way to break this immunity is to kill the Lantern Scorn below. The problem is, if I go down there, the boss will ham-fist me real good. I figured out that if you shoot your gun, sometimes it freaks them out and they run out of hiding spots into sight lines. I kill the lantern scorn, then focus fire on the boss. I finally drop the boss, jump to where the worm is, take five minutes to decompress. All right, let's see how much damage we deal to the Ahamkara. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> Thankfully, this fight spawns the minions in waves and the Ahamkara doesn't pose too much of a threat. And much like the no damage run, I pass through this fight on my first try with relative ease. I try to rush up the stairs and get got by my arch nemesis, a Scorn Raider. I resurrect and pick him off from a distance, one meager bullet at a time. Then I hop on my pike, take off, and I ram into every Scorn of the bridge, just obliterating them left and right. But then I realize that technically that counts as damage that wasn't dealt by the Traveler's Chosen. And then I let the Scorn beat my ass for recompense. I hop onto my pike and avoid every single enemy by carefully driving 
between them, ditch the pike and ascend the elevator. I break it down at the top and beat the cunning with only a damage traveler's chosen. The last chance goes pretty well. I run away from most fights. I can at this point as I fired more bullets than I can count and my finger would cramp it real good. I get to this encounter where an ogre, loosened sword bearer, and a billion grenade happy acolytes spawn. If I poke my head up, I get lasered. If I try to slowly pick them off, I get a sword brought down on my temples. Even standing behind cover is dangerous because the ones that throw grenades aren't afraid to launch a legion of grenades at you, forcing you out into the sight lines of the ogre. Not to mention my gun really starts losing its effectiveness as it used to take four bullets to take down an acolyte. Now it takes an entire mag of headshots. I found out that I can stop the sword bearer from spawning as long as I continually pick up the sword to stop it from despawning. After giving it my all and getting slapped around for an hour, I finally threw in the towel and called it a night with definitely no rage quit. But returning in the morning, I take it slow and steady, killing the ogre from far away and keeping the sword close. Look at these beautiful acrobatics while I take down the hive knight, sliding between his legs and jumping over the strikes. After downing the ogre, I pick off the acolytes whenever I get an opening, then move on to the light bearer, which was actually easier than the previous room, but he just won't stop dodging. Will you sit still, goddamn? I finally managed to kill him, and Rush's ghost is when you crush it, it'll despawn the other enemies, and I move on to the bridge. If there has ever been an encounter that is the bane of my existence more, it would be this one. Never has there been anything that has killed me more in this challenge runs than this section. Enemies deal big damage and spawn all over, and they will disintegrate you before you even knew what happened. Look at this screen at how many deaths and kills I've gotten. I've been on this bridge for about two hours at this point. I switch my tactics up to include a star file protocol and a well of radiance and managed to get to the end boss after 34 attempts. I fought this wizard in circles, slowly lowering his health until I beat this encounter. I celebrated with maximum efficiency and continued up the tower. I tried to throw a healing grenade at this point and in true Riley fashion, I didn't hold the button down long enough and blasted myself into the stratosphere, but in the boss room is when it gets real tough. Fighting the wizard is bad as my gun has lost a lot of its efficiency and when they pop a well, they will actually heal at a rate that is quicker than the damage I can deal. Remember how I said that this challenge has made me realize the worst aspects of all the classes? Well, this guy healing every 30 seconds was a colossal kick in the nuts. Sometimes he would even pop a well immediately after he popped the well. <laughs> just no mercy, just a style on me. Well, each section in this took ages to complete, and each room had the boss healing up to more health than he had when I started the encounter, meaning each room it would be like fighting the boss all over again. When trying to move from section to section as well, you need to pick up a hive sword to break down the doors, meaning you have yet another loosened sword bearer chasing you while there are enemies that are shooting you from all over that deal a significant amount of damage. The first room even has an ogre that will not fear to laser you the moment you peek your head out. Then you have the moths that are constantly buffing them as well. I found the boss was actually easier once they activated their super. It's easy to dodge if you just walk left and right and they don't pop their well, meaning that while they're in a super, they take the most amount of damage. After about 40 minutes in the boss room, I entered the last standoff with Savathun's right hand. This was my pinnacle fight. Warlock versus Warlock. Light versus Light. City Garden versus my sanity. <laughs> but I kill the wizard, dust my knuckles with her ghost, and I blow the sweat off of me with my tiny fan, and take yet another breather as I gear up for the hardest challenge of this entire run, the final showdown with the Witch Queen herself. As I race to fight Savathun and save the Traveler, I took a moment to reflect on the hours that have gone into this challenge and the poetic justice I was about to deliver. It was years ago I fled as the tower burned with nothing but my lightless ghost and my damaged travelers chosen as the Cabal invaded the city. Now I was fighting our toughest foe to date, the one responsible for the death of Cade, the curse in the Dreaming City, the possession of Osiris, and now the stealing of the Traveler. And yet even with my developed arsenal and god-slaying capabilities, here I stand with the gun that started it all, the true message of the Traveler's Chosen. I'll spare you the details of the opening enemies that were coated with shields everywhere and move on to the first encounter. Now back in the ghost missions, I mentioned the Shriekers were the worst, but this is where they really crippled my sanity. Shriekers do everything I mentioned before, but they are all over this area, making it extremely hard to progress without catching some stray Shrieker fire. Not only that, enemies are shielded in this region, and with the suppressive fire, the Shriekers become extremely difficult to take down and the Shriekers can and will melt you in seconds if you're caught in the open. I fought in this area for hours, getting blasted left and right. This gun hits like a wet noodle, and it takes forever to take down even the simplest of enemies. After ages of fighting, I finally managed to clear both floors and get to fight the actual boss of this encounter. I was so excited this was finally coming to an end, and I can go fight Savathun and finish this challenge, but I left the Shriekers on the top and just ran away instead of killing them because they were too hard to kill. This bit me in the ass tremendously. <laughs> Look at this shit. Look at it. 
what? <laughs> I'll never recover from this one. I'm fighting the wizard at the bottom, who doesn't take much damage at all. And when my health gets low, I jump up, and a shrieker from above decides to launch a single bullet at me and kills me, causing me to have to redo the entire fight. This broke me down as a person. I spent probably an hour and a half fighting at this point, and right as the final stretch, Bungie decides to wipe their ass with my forehead. Doesn't get any worse than that. But like I said in the no damage run, Mama didn't raise no bitch, and I restarted the encounter, managed to kill the hive wizard, and vaporized its ghost with a mighty crunch. At the top of this elevator, Savathun tells me that this place is indistinguishable from her mind and that every bullet fired she keeps and counts them all. I've got a funny image in my head of Savathun counting all the spent casings one by one after this challenge because it's probably a fucking lot of them. Seeing my opportunity to run away and not fight these enemies on the balcony, I attempted to flee to the stream that takes you up. This goes horribly as an ogre clowns on me good, but not being one to learn my lessons, I run for the jet, avoiding a lasering and getting off scot-free. And here we are. The final showdown with Savathun. Once again, I am back to deliver death in the tiniest of ways. Savathun herself isn't a big problem as dodging her attacks is easy enough. The true pain comes when the ogres in the side spawn in. Attempting to deal with them gives Savathun enough time to sneak up behind me and drop a Nova Bomb on my head. I found out that having healing grenades was much more potent than using my Void class with the Empowering slash Devourer Riff. As I get a buff, when I heal myself, it recharges my grenade quicker, meaning I'll always have a heal. And when I pop on Starfire Protocol, I have heals that keep me in the fight for much, much longer. Pair that with Well of Radiance, that allows me to deal damage while I'm being healed, and you have a rest be for success. The only downside of the well is that I have to use it from far away from enemies is to not accidentally damage them with the initial blast, because then I would have to kill myself to restart the fight. After dealing enough damage, Savathun will run away and spawn in three light bears. Each one of these are formidable in their own right. After finally taking down one, I get rushed by this titan who notices me putting down a well and launches me into a wall, instantly killing me, making me have to restart. Definitely a textbook crucible play. But after enough attempts, I manage to kill all three light bears with the wizard being the most annoying due to him healing and finally finish Savathun off after an hour and 20 minutes. Now it was time for the final showdown, but before we started, I took a breather, looked behind me, noticed that the gong stopped moving. Very neat. I deal damage to Savathun until her projections show up. I kill them, enter the mirror dimension, and kill the weaving wizards. The damage shouldn't be too bad now that we have Threadcutter. Let's see how much we do. Dear God, why? <laughs> I didn't ask for this much pain. But I use Threadcutter to slowly clip Savathun's wings and show her the truth. And after getting killed by Savathun and constantly running out of time before I can deal any significant damage, I realize that you can keep Threadcutter active as long as you keep it at tier 2. Every time I fight the wizards, there is a considerable chance that I will die, and in this challenge, that could mean hours of progress lost as a result. It does mean that I deal less damage overall, but at least I can fight without having to put myself in that sort of danger. With my death avoidance technique being fully developed, I got caught on some thralls, and Savathun punished me for it, sending me back to the beginning. But with Threadcutter 2 and about an hour of consistent shooting at this point, I was at the last stretch of hell. I planted my feet inside of my Well of Radiance, standing my ground against this monumental foe and sentenced the witch queen to death by way of a thousand cuts. With much rejoicing and celebration, in her dying breath, Savathun says, you miscalculated, Guardian. To which I say, bitch, I just killed you with the worst gun in the game. I don't think I gotta worry about nothing. And as she lay dying in front of me, and with my good work complete, I beat the witch queen with only a damage travelers chosen. put a lot of love into this one, and I hope that it was entertaining. I always hate asking for subscribe since I feel like my work should stand on its own merits, but if you enjoyed and want to give me a hand, drop me a subscribe. If I'm going to ask, I'm only going to do it at the end of these videos, as to not ruin the experience for anyone who watches. If you're looking for my other socials, I ain't got none, go away! <laughs> but seriously, this challenge took ages to complete, and I hope you enjoyed. That being said, I've been Riley, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.